<laughs> Are psychic powers real? Equinox examines the apparent mysteries of psychics past and present. Kate, Maggie. Victoria mediums asked us to believe that spirits produced miraculous phenomena in the seance room. In this century, many have claimed powers of telepathy or the ability to influence objects with nothing more than the power of their minds. If somebody could genuinely demonstrate thought transfer and psychokinesis that you could move objects by the power of thought, that would be bringing to light an entire new field of physics and you get a Nobel Prize for that. The powers do not exist. And I say that both from the point of view of hands-on experience in testing many, many people, and also from the point of view of science. Nothing has been found. Anecdotal stories, all kinds of almost proofs. But that's like being almost pregnant. It doesn't count. Gently, gently. But a significant number of people believe that psychic powers do exist. Television programs such as Beyond Belief claim to investigate the paranormal. But are they just exploiting our appetite for supernatural wonders? And this is not an illusion. The metal is giving away and there is no heat produced. And if the baffling phenomena such as spoon bending presented on these shows are not psychic, how can they be explained? It's one of the few occasions when the phrase, it's getting softer, is good news. <laughs> yeah, look, look at it, it's really, it's almost, look at it, it's there. Ah. Tonight, Equinox explores the secrets of the psychics. Am I going to move house during the next uh, year? At the Metaphysical and Psychic Research Society, a group of psychic healers are conducting a table-turning session. Ooh. Am I going to move Ooh. within five miles? The movements of the table indicate answers to questions. Within ten miles. Clockwise for yes and anti-clockwise for no. You notice the fingers are sliding across the table and not pushing the table at all. Well, if we try to push it, it would stop and it wouldn't work. I might be a grandmother by next year. Oh, good. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Granny. <laughs> the table moves by kinetic energy, which is produced by the whole group. It's um, a form of energy, a mental energy. All kinetic energy stems from the, from the brain itself. The group gathers for both public healing sessions and for private meetings like this one. As well as turning tables, they also sit together in this room in the dark to contact the spirit world. The meeting is a serious meeting to, yeah. to study and develop both our healing, uh, healing, healing abilities and uh, our psychic abilities. First of all, we, we just come together and we, we, our, our thoughts become collective and very gradually the consciousness is, is relaxed, it becomes very relaxed. And sometimes a person can see things in front of them, sense things in front of them. You, you can't say you consciously sense them, but you psychically sense them. In the main, most of the contact we have are spirits that have, of, um, of our ancestors that have been mm. in different incarnations, but they are genetically connected. We call them spirit companions uh, because they do come and teach us a lot of things. There was one person that, that came to us some while ago and his name was Eddie Burkett. Oh, yeah. And Eddie was a woodsman. And what he does, he comes and teaches us about herbs, what mushrooms grow up trees and what flowers to pick for certain healing, for curative effects. Uh, I think one of the other um, phenomena that, that is amazing is, is when you feel a solid object which you know isn't a material object. Uh, for example, as I felt the other week, a, a dog, um, which totally surprised me. Oh, well, basically, it is a dog that, a spirit dog that's been coming now for a little while.
Norman's group sincerely believe that they have direct contact with the spirit world. Yet most observers over the years have been skeptical that such communication exists because of the lack of scientific evidence. It wasn't until the last century that anyone tried communicating with the dead through mediums and dark seances. This became known as spiritualism. It was started almost by accident only 150 years ago in the little town of Hydesville, New York, by two young girls. They were called Kate and Maggie Fox, and they weren't in touch with spirits. They were playing tricks in the dark. They made rapping noises by bouncing fruit on a string and cracking their toe joints on the bedboards. Okay, Maggie? The house was supposed to be haunted and Mrs. Fox thought that the strange phenomena might be communications from the other side. The mother took it very seriously since the telegraph was in the, had just been invented and it was talk about a spiritual telegraph. Girls, are you awake? We heard noises. Was it you, girls? No, Papa. When news leaked out, the Fox's house was besieged by people fascinated by the possibility of communicating with the dead. Led on by their elder sister, who quickly saw where a buck was to be made, Kate and Maggie began their careers as the first spirit mediums. To begin with, the spirits would rap twice for yes and once for no. Then they learned to spell. They would sometimes recite the alphabet, A, B, C, and go through the whole alphabet to wait till a rap came. Let's say it came a B. Then they'd start again, go through the alphabet, and another rap, and then they'd record that next letter. Believe it or not, people even try to write whole books this way. That's a long, drawn-out way of doing it. Gradually, the spirits became more sophisticated, spelling out words by guiding the hands of sitters at seances, or answering questions by tipping a table this way or that. The great British scientist Michael Faraday discovered that this was not the work of spirits, but of unconscious muscular movements, now known as idiomotor action. You place your fingers on the edge of the table without realising it, you can be pushing, you can be pulling in different directions. Only very small forces, but enough to move a glass or perhaps make a table tilt. There are angels hovering. The faithful, however, took such wonders as evidence that they were in touch with those in the afterlife, as spiritualism grew into a mass religion. Angels, angels round. Only two years after the Fox sisters had first heard the rappings, in 1850, there were more than 100 mediums in New York City, and there were 50 spiritualist circles in Philadelphia. And a decade after that, there were millions of believers in America and also in Europe. The medium took center stage, a rare job opportunity for women at the time. The spirits now began to speak, perhaps through a spirit trumpet, and to produce ever more unlikely phenomena. What we're talking about here is mystical stuff, I mean, immortality, life after death. And what was produced was, you know, trumpets blowing, mouth organs and tables lifting. I mean, you know, crass, crass bass stuff. Is that you, John? The skills of the medium had less to do with conjuring spirits there, than conjuring John? tricks. People had great reaching rods. They had sort of telescopic rods in which they could jingle bells at many yards distance. They had lengths of cotton set up, you know, they had, they had the, the, the consulting rooms arranged for, for trickery. I am here. Do you have a message for anyone here, John? I have a message from Beatrice. Yes, my Beatrice. I love you, Alfred. Take care. 
to the vast majority of the people who went to these seances, the one thing that they wanted above all else was to be able to believe that there really was life after death, that they really would be able to get in touch with their departed loved ones. And so and this incredibly flimsy evidence would actually be taken as being very, very strong proof by these people.